you were saying that you started programming pretty early on and you were largely self-taught, right? Yeah, in early 80s, um, my dad brought back uh, Apple II and it had Apple Basic on it and assembly, assembly language compiler. Um, before then, you know, I played Atari and, and television and had video games, but I hadn't done any programming, so. He brought that home and it had a little book, which is like learn to program in 30 days or something. And it was just Apple Basic, so I started on that like on a Friday night. By Sunday, I'd finished the whole book. I was just like, this is amazing. So that kind of got me started. And of course, um, a lot of my inspiration then programming was making games, trying to recreate what I had seen in a game or do something like that. I got a little bit into the hacking and cracking game scene. Um, a lot of the a lot of the harder core, I guess, programming magazines at the time. There was one called uh, Apple Core or something like that. Um, they would have code listings in the back and stuff, but a lot of them taught you how to do assembly and to, and to try to crack games. And that was really how I started learning assembly, was figuring out how to remove copy protection from early games. I knew going to college that I wanted to study artificial intelligence. Um, I looked at a few different colleges. Um, MIT and Stanford and Georgia Tech. But I'd read a few books by some robotics researchers at Carnegie Mellon. So I was kind of excited about that one the most. So that's the one I ended up going to in Pittsburgh. And I did a degree in mathematics and um, computer science there. I still played a lot of games, but definitely in the late 80s and early 90s. I had a Genesis, I had an SNES. I didn't play them too much. My roommates played them more than I did. I was more into studying and, you know, writing, writing algorithms and um, doing research and kind of furthering my education, getting ready for grad school kind of stuff. Looking back on it, I wish I, maybe I had partied more or something like that, but at the time it was so exciting to be like, because I hadn't had people who did computer stuff in high school, it was so exciting to be among people who were smarter in computers than I were and doing cool stuff that I took extra classes, like I took seven classes instead of, you know, like I tried to suck up as much as I could of knowledge there and learn it. I guess I didn't really know that you could get a job making games. Like I kind of played with a little bit, you know, in high school, but I guess it never really occurred to me that I could just do it. There wasn't really that indie scene as much. There certainly was um, people who did graphics and would make real fast graphics demos that would spin things around. So there was definitely sort of that graphics sort of hacking scene a little bit, but uh, there wasn't as much an indie game scene. And I don't know, thinking back on it, I'm like, why didn't I get into games right then? But I think I was more driven by AI and robotics and, and stuff like that. When I eventually did get into games, definitely the AI background, I think, paid off a lot. Um, after college, I worked at a research center building neural network software. And that got pretty huge, and, but mostly it turned into um, doing ports and doing system administration of trying to get it running on different supercomputers. That was um, a few years after college I started realizing that it was just getting to, I was working with you know professors and PhDs and postdocs. It was just getting to be too mathematical and a little bit too much less creative than I wanted. I kind of liked the creative developing software side a little bit more. And that's kind of when I made the switch over to, over to games. And uh, you sort of started off with um, strategy titles, right? I did. Um, my first real games job was um, with Stainless Steel Studios in Boston in 1999, 2000, around that time. Um, they were doing a game called Empire Earth. The founder of the company had worked on Age of Empires and uh, split off and kind of started his own company to make Empire Earth which um, was a crazy RTS game that spanned all of history from cavemen up to robots in the future. And uh, that was really fun. Um, I found I really liked working with the artist. Many of my best friends in the company, even ones that I'm friends with now, um, were artists. And that collaboration of being a programmer and writing really good code and having an artist make cool art and putting it together and having each of your others, my code looking better and his art performing better. That was really like electric. I, I really liked that. So that's kind of where I would position myself. Do you miss working on those 
supercomputers? I do a little bit. Um, it's the robotic stuff I miss because some of the guys I worked with then ended up going to working on Mars Rover. Yeah. You know, I see other guys who are working at Google for the autonomous cars who are driving themselves across the country. You know, like part of me misses that sort of, oh man, that was kind of fun doing robotics. Like it was neat, but it was a, it's a different pace. You know, it's um, doing robotics. It's, you have a lot of real world constraints that kind of slow you down like dirt and <laughs> um, all the mechanical side of it. And with video games being in a virtual world, a lot of the code is the same. And just the code doesn't have to worry that your tire's slipping. Yeah. You just go, you know, like, so you can get a lot more done, I think, in, in video games where you're, where you're writing similar code, but you just don't have to handle as many of the real world circumstances that, you know, software for an autonomous car would have to handle. How did you um, end up coming to Double Fine? Like, what was it about uh, the company that drew you here in the first place? That stainless steel, the company studios that I was working on in Boston, closed down. Um, with our third game, the finances didn't work out and the company closed down. And uh, I took about six months off and just traveled. <clears throat> and after that, I didn't even know if I wanted to do games anymore. I was kind of burnt out. Um, but I decided to start interviewing. And I came out here to San Francisco. Well, there's a lot of bigger game companies. There was more then. Um, LucasArts was still around. and. Uh, EA and obviously um, a few others I interviewed at, um, they were too big. Um, when I went there to interview, I couldn't meet the designer of the game I was going to work on. I just talked to other programmers. The interview culture was very much, how can they prove they're smarter than you and get up on a whiteboard? I'm sure you people have heard of the programming test you have to do where you're writing code on a whiteboard, which is nearly impossible. They seem very antagonistic, you know, like you finish the interview and you're just like, that wasn't fun, you know, like, you don't like the guys you interview with, you know, kind of thing. So there was one interview I came to out here at a large company, and the project had actually been canceled, and the person who I was supposed to interview wasn't around, so they had me interview with all their other teams. And I asked, like, well, if I get hired, which team would I be working on? And they're like, oh, you'll just be at, like, programmer level five, and we'll put you on something. And for me, I'm like, I can't work on a game if I don't know what the game, you know, like, I didn't just want to be shuffled around as a, as a technology tool, essentially. So um, a recruiter that had helped, another one of my friends <coughs> from Stainless Steel, he told me, hey, they're not quite advertising for a position yet, but I know some people at Double Fine, and they might be looking for someone with your skills. They're making a game that has some strategy elements to it, and they don't have anyone there who's had a lot of experience with RTS, where I'd just been doing real-time strategy games for about six or seven years. So it was kind of an opportunistic hire. Um, I stayed here an extra day and uh, <clears throat> came by and interviewed, got to speak to the whole team, but what really changed my mind was getting to sit with Tim. He pulled out his book of uh, Brutal Legend artwork. The game was at a very early state. It didn't really have much going, but he had a book of ideas and it was just so fun sitting down with him and hearing him tell the story of what Brutal Legend was going to be and seeing that spark in his eye and like knowing this designer cares about this project, you know, like it's an imaginative world. It's a really friendly team. I got to meet with everybody at the whole company, you know. Nobody asked me really hard questions. I mean, there were some technical ones, but it was mostly what kind of games do you like and, you know, what do you think makes a good team member and those kind of things. So for me, it was that, that culture fit seemed to be a lot better. And I guess they liked me too, so. They hired, they hired me that day, which was nice. But yeah, I'd say my focus was mostly AI, working on the enemy creatures and kind of making them unique. I did a lot of the open world AI system of all the animals chasing each other around and fighting stuff. It's funny because the time I got to spend on that was almost more extra time. Like, uh, we didn't really have a lot of budget for building out that. But I'd always really been interested in animal behavior and AI, so we built out a system that um, had predators and prey, and they would chase each other down. And like if a big bear-like monster was fighting against a real small guy, they would run away. But if there was three of them, they'd think they were strong enough to gang up. So they would, three would fight against them until one got killed off, and then the other two would run away and try to find another one. So you'd get this crazy, you know, emergent behavior of 
the bear chasing these little guys and them kind of luring him into a trap and then all the little guys attacking him and taking him down. That's that's just something you'd see driving by in your in your deuces at your rigs, you know, and be like, I'm getting away from that bear because he could smash my car up, you know, so. But it's fun to see. Um, you can definitely interact with the creatures in that game and use them to your advantage and ride them even if you're if you get the right skills, so. That was fun. It's a fun part of the game, but it's a, a small part, you know, like it's, it obviously doesn't make or break the game, but I think for the gamer that finds it, it's pretty cool. Uh, there was a core team of programmers. <coughs> Sorry. I think I'm losing my voice a little bit. Do you guys want to try another day? Like I, I, I would be perfectly fine with that. If yeah, that might to, be uh, better just because I, I don't think I'm going to get, it's gonna, just going to get worse, I think, a little. Worse. I mean, it doesn't bother me, but I don't think my delivery is. Why don't we just do, uh, why don't we say like take the weekend? Okay. Maybe we could try again on Monday. But if we could just have you wear the same shirt. Okay. We're gonna pick up back where. Oh sure. You came on for Brutal Legend. And. Um, yeah, that was fun. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of excitement on that project, and we had a pretty big team that was still ramping up, and a lot of cool things going in every day. It was. <clears throat> as fun as it is to be on these small teams and see how stuff gets done, when you're on a bigger team, more stuff gets done faster. So every day, at least somebody's checking in new features and things. Where the artist would draw the most fantastic, weird creature you could imagine on a piece of paper, and we'd be like, okay, how can we make that character fun and cool and work and be gameplay? And, you know, Brutal Legend has this one character that's head is attached to a chain, and it takes its head off in its hand and then grabs the chain and swings its head around and throws it, hits things along the way and then yanks it back onto its head and then it starts working like a head again. And that's a pretty complicated, as you can imagine, like character model. It's definitely not very realistic at all. Um, challenges like that are kind of what, what we would take on where as a programmer you're just like, okay, you know, but that's also sort of the fun. And I, that's what drew me here, you know, like bring it on kind of, you know, draw the craziest thing, we'll make it work. And uh, in Brutal Legend, that was definitely part of the fun of trying to figure out how to make those things go. Now, um, <clears throat> when you came on for Brutal, I mean, you were working in the, the boot engine, mm -hmm. which was uh, new. It wasn't what they used for Psychonauts. It was basically built specifically for right. Brutal Legend. <clears throat> so can you tell us about what Buddha is and what it functions? Sure. Um, it's a C++ engine to start with. Um, as an engine, it, it does a little bit more than some other engines um, in the sense that it handles graphics and physics and pretty much all the gameplay. Um, it has some light Lua scripting on top of it, and that's what we've kind of pushed further in the recent projects, particularly even with Massive Chalice. Um, most of the gameplay we're doing in Lua. But um, with Brutal Legend being a pretty complicated game with driving and RTS and missions and a lot of voice speaking. The, we had to build a lot into Brutal Legend to handle that kind of thing. So as the engine goes, it, it really was a flexible one that you could kind of use for different things. And that was sort of neat when we split up into small projects that it was a chance to stretch it and play with this toy that we'd built um, and see what it could do. You know, could it do both, both, uh, both trenched and Stacking and Costume Quest, you know, those are all definitely different looks, different types of games. Is can we use that same tech to do all those? And I think a lot of the, a lot for the reason why Brutal Legend was so many different games, it really put us in a good place to kind of use our engine on all those different games, <clears throat> as well as a lot since then. Yeah, Massive Chalice was an interesting game to take on. Um, even with Stacking in the Cave, coming in as a programmer, your first thought is kind of, how will this engine be able to support this game? I, you know, what do we have in the engine that we can reuse? And which stuff are we gonna have to write? And what, you know, what are the risks? What's the biggest technical hurdle that we have to hit? With Massive Chalice, it was different in that it was a turn-based strategy game. So we really didn't have a, a representation in the world of like a, a grid. And most everything in the game likes to move around on its own. But in a turn-based game, they sort of have to stand still until you tell them to move almost like chess pieces. So, and we never really had a game with mouse input where you're clicking on things in the sense that you're 
clicking on them to selecting them and clicking where to move. So getting that mouse input working, getting that the camera was also kind of unique in Massive Chalice and kind of rebuilding a almost like a desktop table board, a grid that everything's going to move on. Initially we would even consider like a hex grid versus a square grid and would you have some verticality? Would guys go up and down stairs and did they need to know if they were higher than others? Those were a lot of the first issues we kind of flushed out with the game. Both their technical complexity and like how much time and how big a team we had to do it influenced kind of how we designed them, but that was some of the first stuff we got going in the game. Now, um, you came from an RTS background. Right. How significantly different is RTS from turn-based? Uh, quite a bit. I mean, you're still thinking about a lot of the same things. Um, it's combat, so you have hit points and you have damage. You have things like buffs on characters. Um, they still pathfind, but what you're what the difference is is that in RTS you have to be doing that all the time, so the character is constantly reevaluating that state, and it's constantly adjusting the things moving. In turn-based, things pretty much stand still. So, for instance, when you issue an attack in Massive Chalice, I can pretty much compute at the beginning of that attack everything that's going to happen, even though there might be a complex chain of events where the arrow might fire, it hits something, it explodes, that knocks somebody back, that thing explodes. Um, it's pretty predictable what that change is. While real time, particularly if it's multiplayer real time, who knows whether that guy's going to move or what he's going to do in the middle of it. So because you can predict that a little bit more, um, particularly on the AI side, he can be a little bit smarter. Basically, you let the AI think out its actions a little bit further and evaluate more stuff than you would in real time where it has to do it in like a split second. It can take a few seconds to do it per enemy and strategy, so, and players expect it to see it behave a little bit better. A real time, most of those are just, they beeline for you and they start hitting you. In a strategy, particularly turn-based strategy, you expect the AI to do a flanking maneuver or to go after your weakest character or to retreat if it gets hurt kind of stuff. So your AI behavior is a little bit more, more advanced, I guess I would say, and less, less reactive and more kind of planning. It's nice as an AI programmer to be turn-based because you have a little bit of breathing room. You don't have to try to make everything super quick and you know just look at five choices because that's all the time you have to look at. You can actually look at the full set of choices and try to even go predict a few moves ahead if you want, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a little bit more easy to control and test. Um, you can, because you're taking turns with the AI, you can switch it and play the AI player versus a human kind of thing and it's a little bit more controlled. It feels a little bit more like I say a chess game where it's you can go a little bit deeper. So the AI program it's, it's fun. Um, <clears throat> a lot of traditional AI in academia is not very much real time. Most of it's also a lot of offline processing. Uh, some of the robotic stuff of course has to react in real time. Cars that drive on the road of course have to react really fastly, fast. but um, most of the AI you do is more, let's process it offline and do a lot of calculations. So it's fun to get to where I can spend a little bit more time on letting the AI think about things. We have one character that runs in and explodes. He's obviously going to need to behave a little bit differently, and that influences the AI a bit. Um, when it runs in, he needs to figure out how can he deal the most damage. So he won't just run up to the closest enemy and blow up. He'll run him to the middle of your group where he can hit three of you at one time. Um, so that gives them a little bit different flavor. Um, some of the enemies know when to retreat or when to heal each other, but all those factor into design in the sense where you want the game to have a lot of strategic choices. You want to see variety in the enemy, and a lot of the variety comes in their visual language and just the type of attack they do, but the more you can put that variety in the AI, the more it seems like they're thinking more and that they have a different personality. So. We look for every opportunity we can for that. But how much leeway do you have to just kind of react to the experiences you're having in the game and inject things in there you think will make the experience better? Just as kind of like yeah, quite instantaneous. Yeah, quite a bit actually. I mean, it's, it's a complex game. If you look at what we're, you know, as we're rounding out the end of the project now and you're looking at what we got uh, over what we started with, a lot of Massive Chalice started without much design. Um, if you look at the original Kickstarter, 
you know, there's kind of the notion that it's going to be a tactical game, you know, maybe there's going to be different classes, it's going to go through time, you might have children, you know, but there wasn't a really what I would call firm design by any means. It was barely more than a twinkle in the eye design idea. And um, so naturally the game has had to evolve. But it's been fun. We really took on the idea that we would get it playable as soon as we could, even with the bare basics. You could boot up the game and play something. And because we've done that, most of the team plays the game a lot. Um, I try to, when I work on it over the weekends, reserve most of that to just trying to be a gamer and play it. You know, sit down for four hours and pretend like I'm playing it and keeping a notepad of, sometimes I'll come back into work on Monday with like six pages of paper of like notes of, here's the bugs I found and here's what's working and here's what wasn't. And through a lot of that, a lot of design meetings, I think we've got it, you know, it's evolved a bit over time. We've kind of tried to figure out which parts are the core good parts that make it a good game and which parts aren't really that fun and we don't really need. Um, yeah, so it's been good. But as far as like making changes, Brad gives me a lot of leeway. Like I can go in and kind of write something. But generally I try to run it by him first, you know. <laughs> I'll be like, I have this idea. We, Everyone on the team I think has some ideas of some cool things we'd like to put in, but we know we don't really have enough time. But maybe if we get a little time on a weekend or in the evening, we got a little feature we might want to put in or something. Um, we generally run a Brad, Brad first, but he's been, as a team lead, very open. I think it's great because everyone on our team really likes the game and likes the style of game um, and plays the game. You don't always get that with a bigger team. And because our team's small and everyone really likes this kind of game, we all can contribute in that sense. I think as far as design impact, more than other teams I've worked on, everyone on the team has had a pretty good input into kind of the direction the game's going and kind of understood what it's trying to be. Um, so what we're looking at here is a tactical battle in Massive Chalice. Um, I can move the camera around using the keyboard. Uh, I can zoom in and out using the mouse and I can rotate it around and look at it. What we see here in the middle is uh, the five characters of my party and you can select them. The numbers above their head are like their hit points and <clears throat> down below these are some of the skills of the current character I have selected. Here's over in the bottom right corner is his weapon he's using and on the left you see a various number of different flags. Those represent the house sigils um, of the character you're in. These are like um, things that people might have seen in strategy type games before. But right. it's something that Double Fine's never had to implement. So. I mean, yeah, it's are neat. these like it's solved problems or do you have to figure out from scratch how to do all this stuff? It's nice to have another game as a reference. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's not something that... I've worked with Fog of War a little bit before in real-time strategy. Um, and we had some of it in Brutal Legend, but not as, not as detailed as this. Not as, you know, square accurate, I guess I would say, and um, not implemented in the same way. But uh, you know, even if other games have done it before, if you haven't, you still have to implement it, and you can see how the other games do it, but obviously you don't have their code. So you just kind of have to guess and sometimes figure out your own algorithms for it. Sometimes you probably come across the same solution. Sometimes you'll come about it in your own way. But um, they're, they're solved problems in the sense that they've been solved in other games, but you still kind of have to solve them yourself. You know, it's, a, it's not, uh, they're not impossible, but it's unlikely you can just kind of go on the web and look it up and have it tell you an answer. So even things as fundamental as like camera control, right? Um, did you have to <coughs> redevelop that specifically? We did. Um, I had done a bit of camera work before. <laughs> it was funny, I still have the same notebook I used on stacking. And in stacking, obviously it was a kind of a third person over the shoulder camera, but you had dolls of different sizes that would move the camera up and down, and sometimes you'd go through tight spaces. Um, camera is always sort of a fun thing to work on because it's 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 you as a player. You don't really see it, but in, you rep, you know it represents your viewpoint as a player. So having that be smooth um, and having that work right. This is a different camera. Usually in our games, we attach the camera to the player, and this one it's its own entity that floats around in the sky and it's sort of our first scrolling camera, so being able to hit left and right and scroll, we wanted to put in. Um, I decided to make it a little bit smoother 
by having a little spring on it. So as you can see as you move, it kind of settles into the position rather than snapping to it. But uh, all that, even when you rotate, it kind of speeds up and slows down and has an acceleration. And you know, if you end your turn and it cuts over to the enemy, that speed at which it goes over to them and then recenters and then how it chooses to what to put in the center of the screen. If the enemy's attacking you with a long range weapon, you want to see both of them at the same time. You know, when he fa fires his shot, so the camera will pull out or, or scroll over to kind of get the center of the two of you in, in range. All that stuff is kind of fun camera things to get in. Having the camera slide right when it hits, a, hits the edge of a volume, that's custom code you kind of have to write or collision system you have to put in to make that feel right. If it starts to stutter or if it gets hooked on the edge, it's kind of like your, your shirt getting hooked on a nail. It's something you move around so naturally as a player that you don't even want to be thinking about the camera. You just kind of want to be thinking about what, what actions are my characters going to be doing. So having a camera that you can, that just feels right um, is a lot of what people talk about when they say the game feel. Particularly for a game like this where you're not individually moving your character. You're telling him where to go, but you're not really steering him or moving him forward or doing like a third person game. The camera really kind of is your real time character. Why the why the characters on the battlefield are the, kind of the turn based? I mean, can we see code for a uh, AI routine? Yeah, I could go over some of this AI stuff. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so um, part of what the uh, AI does when it decides to take its turn, um, I'll quick switch back quickly to the tactical AI. Um, if you see this function I have here, so we're, what we're looking at is uh, our 2HB, our Lua debugger, and editor code. Um, it's sort of an editor that lets you see the, the different Lua files and also sort of run the game and set breakpoints and debug it. But uh, when the AI takes his part of the turn, one of the things he does is he picks the best AI character to move. Um, when the AI does his turn, he's going to move all the AI characters, but he has to do them in a certain order. So. How do we figure out which guys should go first on the enemy team? Um, we flag different characters. If you see this code here, this, this function kind of starts here and goes down, down to here. Um, the stuff in green that has the, sort of the minuses before it like this are what we call comments. They kind of let us put notes in the code uh, to tell us what's going on. <clears throat> Pretty much what we have underneath here is a couple different loops. So the first one here, this for loop, it goes through the whole enemy tactical party gets all the enemy characters, makes sure they're alive, sees if they have any moves left. It checks to see this uh, one statistic on them called turn priority. Um, that's something that's calculated elsewhere, but pretty much it says move this enemy before this enemy. Um, a ranged unit might come, might want to fire after a melee unit's gone into attack. Uh, a character that's going to run in and blow up probably wants to do that before the melee character goes in so he doesn't damage his own his own guy in the battle. So <clears throat> that kind of helps sort them. Um, once it has all the enemies in a list, then it's going to go through and decide what to do with each character. Um, from here, I'm going to go over and look at one of our, um, one of our basic uh, functions that's sort of rolled into a basic combat skill that every, every character has. It actually handles a l most of the different types of combat and other type of skills kind of build on top of it, but it's turned into a function to, to handle a lot of different cases. In this case, every skill you can have, <clears throat> and in the game you might have a skill like a follow-up shot or a throw grenade or a use health potion, but your basic one is just move forward to a tile or move forward and attack something. Um, so in this case, the AI, once it knows who it's going to move, he's going to come through and look at his skill and evaluate its fitness. Now, AI might have different skills. You might be able to do five or six different things. The AI probably doesn't have as many as your characters, but he has a few. Um, he's going to figure out which one of those is the best to do. He's already figured out where his friends are nearby. This is this list of visible allies. And he's got a pointer back to the tactical AI function that was picking the other enemies to use. Um, it's probably already, because going through the map and looking at every target, and seeing if we have line of sight to them, kind of seeing if he's blocked by a tree or behind something, that's a pretty expensive process. We don't want to be doing that every time every enemy looks at something. 
So before the AI even moves, this note here says that it's, it's pre-computed the targets so that we don't have to compute them later. It's uh, more of an optimization kind of thing we put in, so you're not constantly scanning over the whole map uh, every time the AI is thinking, maybe should I use this skill or not. <clears throat> um, I'll scroll down a little bit. You'll see uh, it's looking through all the characters in the tactical party. Some skills you use um, might be used on enemies, or some might be used on friendly characters. And this block here kind of says, well, if I don't care if he's friendly or enemy, then I'll ignore it. Otherwise, make sure if he's hostile, he's on the other team, or if he's friendly, he's on my team. So like a heal potion or something, if the AI was going to use that on another uh, AI, he'd probably be, that skill would be set to friendly. So really what this function is trying to do is it's going to come back with a number and say, you know, a number like 100 might mean this skill is really good to use. I think we should use it now. And it's going to go through all your skills and rate them. If you had like a grenade throwing skill, but you were out of grenades, that would come back with zero. The skill is useless. Or if there weren't any enemies you could actually hit with a grenade because they were blocked or they were behind trees, it would come back with a low score. So pretty much the one that comes back with the highest score is going to win. So as it goes through, it's pretty much doing all the checks here to see if you can actually attack it. Here we're looking at an enemy, seeing is he alive? You know, can we see that tile he's on? Um, this is the cost it would cost to move to that tile. This is a function here that actually calls into the C code. So we represent a lot of the visibility map used to do the fog of war, which is kind of a graphics feature in the C code. And the Lua code often just does stuff within Lua, but sometimes it goes into the C code and asks for stuff. And determining, well, if a cell is visible to another character, that's all stored on the C++ side because a lot of that is used to draw the fog of war, which is a graphics operation. So storing it on the C side made the C++ side of the engine made more sense in that the graphics needs to draw that every frame, 30 or 60 frame times per second. It needs faster access to it than the Lua code. So in that sense, we have a really nice interface from Lua code to our game engine. Through a lot of Lua functions, I'll start with game, or you'll see other ones that start with draw something in the UI or something like that, or play a sound. Those are typically the interfaces you see between the Lua code and the game. At any rate, we're trying to figure out if this function, um, if this particular skill could be used. <clears throat> so pretty much it's going here and it's evaluating the targets. This line here, this trace, is something we often use in programming for debugging. When you actually play the game, all these things will be commented out and it won't print them on the screen. But as we're trying to figure out, hey, why didn't the AI at attack that guy? Did he figure out something wrong or is there something we didn't think? The AI gets complicated enough that even as a game maker, sometimes you don't realize why it did what it did. Um, could be a bug that you made, could be some bad data. Maybe I accidentally put the character on the wrong team. Maybe I thought he had grenades, but it really it was checking his number of health potions or something like that. So these trace statements here, they're a pretty useful programming technique that just spits these out. And if you're running the game in a debugger like this, you'll get a nice window full of lots of lines of these things that tell you kind of what's going on. <coughs> in this case, the AI is going to spit out that I found this target. I think he's attackable. So you'll see that in the output window. And you should see that for every target that it thinks it can attack. Um, after it's decided if it can actually attack the guy or not, um, if it can't attack the guy, it's considering that maybe <clears throat> it might walk up, to the, uh, walk up to the other target, try to get closer. So that's what these other two sections are here. In this case, we're checking to see if the target is stealthed. <clears throat> we still want to know that you, know, you wouldn't sneak up to it if it's stealthed because we don't want the AI to cheat. We don't want the AI to be um, to sneak up and find your guys who are hidden stealth nearby it because that would feel like the AI is cheating on you. So we don't let the AI you know, even sneak up on, on stealth guys. In this case, the character's not stealth, so um, he's a candidate for sneaking up on. It might be the case that you can't see the other character, but one of the other characters on your team can see it. That's what this check is here. So. Even though the AI can't see you if you stealth, we want the sense that the AI could, um, could, see, could see characters that its other teammates could. Yeah, I think that's one thing as a programmer that you, um, you know, looking back on this, I'm like, this, is start, this code's starting to get a little ugly. 
um, you try to write things to be modular and to, um, you know, this amount of nesting and stuff is probably, as a program, you're like, well, this is getting too complex. There's too many special cases here. But as the complexity of the game grows, like before we put in stealth, didn't even have this section, right? It was when we put in stealth as something your character could do, it was like, well, hey, I shouldn't see you if you're stealth. Um, even though he could see that tile on the map, it wasn't behind a tree. You might be standing there in broad sight of where he normally could see, but you're stealth. So um, this was a little bit of extra bit that I put in where if you have an ally that can see something, then you can see it. So if you had another AI, two AIs on the opposite side of the map and they couldn't see each other, you wouldn't expect them to be able to communicate about, hey, I could see this. They don't have radios, per se, right? At least, at least not in Massive Chalice. But um, if there's somebody a few feet from you and he can see around a tree, you would think that, that that would be enough for the AI demons to be able to see it. So that's why we kind of put that in to make them, make them a little bit smarter. It's always tricky with the AI. You're kind of balancing that. You want it to be smart, but not too smart. You don't want it to cheat, like see an invisible guy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you don't want it to seem like just a zombie horde that's just, you know, running at you without any, without any smarts. Is there any aspect of like artificial stupidity that gets put in there, where the computer might occasionally do a bad action? You do typically. Um, um, like in this case, it returns back a good score. Here I put in a note that it returns back a, a good value of 100. Um, generally, this basic move, even if you don't have a good target, you're still going to want the character to move. But when it actually decides if it's going to execute it, typically you add in some randomness. So even though it says, here's the best thing for me to do, sometimes you might roll a die and say, one in three chance, and just act stupid instead. You know, or it doesn't, mo it doesn't move, or it forgets to attack. Um, it's much easier to make the AI stupid than it is to make it smart. And usually making it stupid means it, it doesn't figure out its best action. But usually you start with making it as smart as you can, and then you dumb it down you know, for easier difficulty levels or for you know, easier AIs. A um, little bit lower here is something that we added recently, which is remembered cells. So it used to be that uh, if you ducked behind a tree, the AI couldn't see you, he would totally forget you ever existed because he can no longer see you. Um, the nice thing as a player is you could hang out behind that tree for as long as you want, heal yourself up, take a few turns doing nothing. <clears throat> but it seemed kind of, the AI, AI seemed kind of stupid in the sense that it should know that it just saw you. So what we added in was it remembering cells. So anytime you go out of visibility of the AI, it remembers the last place it saw you, <clears throat> and it stores that and has a list of kind of interested spots that it, it thinks you might be. And it'll head over to that spot. So as long as you can still stay behind a tree or stay in the fog of war, he won't know where you went to, but you can sometimes set a trap for him that way mm. by knowing he saw me duck behind that tree, I bet he's going to be coming and kind of set your other guys up to see him. So to me, at least, that seems a little bit better. But it's something you don't want it to happen every time. Otherwise, it's too predictable. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you prioritize the most or you think are some of the most important things you've learned? I think it's important to kind of try to identify what your most risky things are. Like I said early in the project, every game is going to be different. And every game is going to take on your challenges. Um, some of them you have control over, some of them you don't. But the ones at least you know about, don't pick too, don't take on too many challenges. You know, like kind of identify technically, you know, what you can achieve with your budget and your time frame, and what you think is going to be the most risky, and try to hit that part first. You know, get that done. In our case, you know, it was we're making a new tactical game. We got to get that tactical engine up and running. But um, yeah, don't try to try to get that right. But depending on your project, particularly here at Double Fine, things are going to change. So get it to the point where it's working first, and then get it to where you can test it as soon as you can. It isn't really till you actually get in the game and start playing it that you 
that things come out, particularly if you're doing a new type of game you haven't made. If you like make shooters and you're making your third or fourth shooter, you've worked through a lot of that process. But if you're doing a new game you haven't done, the best thing you can do is get it up and running. Even with low level graphics, even with no sound, you know, like as soon as you can get your team up and running and seeing it, even just shifting a camera angle and the thing I said about like this camera angle, you never get to see the sun, so the artist doesn't have to spend time making a sky. Like that makes a difference earlier on, you know. It, it might not be something you realize until you actually get in there and do it. Um, that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned is get the game up and running and testing as soon as you can. And then that's even better because the more people testing it, be it your te team or external testers, the more bugs they find. You know, like sometimes people don't really play their game until they reach a milestone and then they let everyone play it on one day, you know, when it's all looking good and shiny and polished. But, you know, then you get a whole bunch of bugs on that day, but it would have been nice if you knew about those bugs a while earlier, you, you know, earlier you could have fixed them. So I really like that approach of getting it up and running as fast as you can. Probably one of the biggest lessons. Um, the other is really to be flexible. Um, the best games change over time, despite your best design doc. And here at Double Fine, we work really loosely with design docs. But despite the best one you have, it's going to change. And programmers really kind of hate that change because you have to throw away complete systems that you wrote. Or you, you think, man, if I would have known that change was going to happen, I would have designed it differently. Um, if you go in knowing that it's going to change, um, it doesn't mean you're going to write the code perfect the first time. but at least you're probably going to write the code to where it's a little bit more resilient to change. Or at least you'll, in my case, be smart enough to put down comments in your code so that when it does change, you know why you did certain things. Um, even things when you, we use uh, Perforce as our source control. It's really easy to check something in to source control and just be like, blarg, or like, here's some code, or this dumb stuff. You know, like, leave a comment that isn't that useful, but if you actually try to make yourself leave a comment on why you did it and which change it was for, when you make a change, you can go back and see, okay, I checked this in because of this or we changed this because of that. Forcing yourself to kind of be a little bit more disciplined, I think, pays off in the end. <laughs>